This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Fiscal cliffs, fiscal meltdowns, fiscal catastrophe. From the New York report of the State Budget Crisis Task Force, first, the bad news. Medicaid spending crowding out other needs. Federal deficit reduction threatens the budget. Rising retirement costs. Local government fiscal stress. Debt. Vast infrastructure needs. The good news? Well, we'll have to get that from our guest. Bringing us the news, both good and bad, is Richard Ravitch, the co-chair of the State Budget Crisis Task Force, whose bland-sounding New York report is policy and political dynamite. Mr. Ravitch has a distinguished history of public service. He rescued the Urban Development Corporation in the 1970s, is widely credited with saving the MTA as chairman from 1979 to 1983, he also chaired the 1988-89 Charter Revision Commission. I worked for him. <laughs> and he has served as Major League Baseball na labor negotiator. In July 2009, he was sworn in as Lieutenant Governor of New York. He's New York government's Mr. Fixit, a civic treasure. Welcome back, Richard. Always a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. You read this report. And we've got to go back to mythology. Cassandra. I was reminded in a very gracious note from Ed Koch uh, that he sent me a year and a half ago, uh, reminding me that Cassandra proved to be correct in his predictions. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I don't wish to be right. I, I am very, very concerned that we've been kicking the can down the road through a series of devices for a long time and that our economy is not going to grow fast enough to overcome those mistakes and those one-shots that we use to balance our budgets and that we're in potentially serious difficulty. On the other hand, I'm an optimist and I believe in a democracy that we will have ultimately the political leadership that will resolve Wait a minute, these that's questions. the good news? That's we, the, you're optimistic? Good leadership? Are you, uh, I'm almost you believe speechless. that. Okay. Uh, do you see any evidence of that? In because the, 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 the alternative is, in some instances, bankruptcy. Just as New York City came very close to having to file bankruptcy in 1975, but it was ultimately uh, a governor, a great governor with a, uh, a first-rate mind and a lot of guts and a president who ultimately made a tough decision and uh, the banks and the unions all ultimately agreeing to do that which they swore just a few weeks earlier they would never do. Are we in a, enough of a known crisis no. that we could bring that together? No, not yet. So it's, it's down the road, but we can almost see the end of the road? I, I believe that I, I, we are going to see an increasing squeeze, an increasing conflict between the promises that we made as a society, valid, legitimate promises to pay benefits to the people who work for government, uh, promises to provide health care, social services, food, a uh, variety of things, that those promises, the cost of keeping those promises is outdistancing the uh, revenues that we're receiving today under our so, uh, so we have these costs of good intention. How do we, what are some of these? Go through, if you will, briefly the findings of the New York State report, and, but also the national report, because you folks studied six states, and some states are in a bigger mess than we are, Illinois and California, for example. Well, California just passed a mammoth tax increase, uh, which enables them to begin to catch up on their retirement obligations, 
though it's very interesting to note that the proposed spending on things like the court system and education are no different than they were six years ago in California. So obviously uh, the tax increase was essential to avoid a catastrophe right. for the public pension funds, which is what Illinois is facing. The larger states with more poor people and strong labor, public employee labor unions are the states that have uh, the greatest crunch. In a state like Texas, where the government is very conservative, the level of spending on education, the level of spending on health care is very minimal. And consequently, uh, they, they don't face the same kind of crunch that we do in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Rhode Island, et cetera. But in a sense, it's almost worth the crunch given the social consciousness of those states, or is the fiscal imperative so fundamental that well, it should drive it, or it will drive it? The question is, how do you, how, by what political process do you, do you adjust these, these uh, uh, imperatives? And it's very easy. I mean, there are a lot of people in the business community who think that the problem is the benefits that are paid to public employees. From my point of view, and I come out of the business community, basically, to me, a promise to pay a retirement benefit to somebody who worked for government for 20 years is morally indistinguishable from a promise to pay somebody interest on money they lent you. It's so, morally, but not necessarily constitutionally. No, constitutionally, they're, they're better protected in New York State. Five states in the United States have constitutional protections of pension benefits. Other states do not. Other states believe that you can modify benefits by uh, particularly benefits that were not already accrued at a given point sure. in time. Uh, what about retiree benefits other than pensions, though? They're not guaranteed. Well, Health benefits, for example, are not guaranteed by the Constitution. I, I Is that an area where, you know, ambitious Pauls, you know, just wanting to close this, close well, it? you haven't heard much <clears throat> discussion about that in the mayoral campaign so far, but I believe that the next mayor will face an unfunded OPEB liability. That's health care for... Uh, New York City employees of in excess of $90 billion. And that doesn't even count the short-term labor union expenditures for contracts that have been held in abeyance. You talk about kicking no, the can that is, down the road. No, it, that's totally separate. No, I get it. From the fact that all the collective bargaining agreements have expired. Right. And the independent budget office of the city has estimated that to give everybody a catch-up to the, the one union that got an increase would cost about five and a half billion dollars. <throat> so you're, you know, there's a new mayor uh, inaugurated on uh, January 1st, uh, 2014, and they, they call you up and say, Dick, whisper in my ear. What do you whisper in the next mayor of, New well, the mayor of New York's ear? Or let's say the day after the election, they need some lead time, so they call you up. Well, first of all, the business community has got to develop far more knowledge and sophistication about the budget problem. They have opinions. The opinions reflect, understandably, uh, their own in their own interests, uh, which generally are don't raise taxes because we have a lot of mobility, and a lot of businesses, particularly the financial services business, can move um, without any damage to themselves, and that would be a terrible thing for New York. And there are legitimate concerns, and um, there are concerns that are uh, just the moral equivalent of a union wanting to make sure that their benefits go went up and, and their members got more money. Sure. So the question is, we have to have a common ground of knowledge on the part of the business community and the labor unions. I'm not sure that exists. Also, let me just interrupt for a moment, nor, as you argue in this report and elsewhere, is there any real analysis of what federal deficit reductions might lead to? So you have this absence of analysis. That is correct, but there's a, a very worrisome disconnect between what's going on in, in Washington and what's going on in, in the states. 
uh, let me give you an illustration because you raise a very important point. <clears throat> People with, with the best of intentions say we can save a lot of money at the federal level if we make people eligible for Medicare when they reach the age of 67 instead of 65. That deferring the eligibility age would save a lot of federal money. But most states and cities have obligations to pay health care to their employees until they're eligible for Medicare. So if you postpone the federal eligibility wow. age, you're increasing the burden of state and city governments. Certainly true in New York, uh, very significantly. Give you another illustration. People say, let's raise more federal revenue by eliminating the deductibility of state and local income taxes. Uh, no question it would raise more federal revenue, but it will drive a lot of people out of states like New York and Illinois and California. My God, you know, New York state budget. We've just had within the last two weeks the governor releasing the budget and one of the more controversial elements was this smoothing out of the pension cost. You know, this, and you and, and the report argues that, quote, reliance on amortization is a slippery slope. What's your response to this? The response has been generally positive. Only a couple of people like the mayor of Syracuse and Tom DiNapoli have come out against this. What's your, what's your look at this? Well, first of all, in 2010, the state enacted a law that permitted uh, the state itself to uh, uh, borrow from the pension fund and make the contributions right. that they were actuarially obligated to make. Uh, so there's over $2 billion now of accrued uh, obligations to the New York State Pension Fund. Uh, this bill would further, in a very complicated fashion, uh, uh, expand that kind of borrowing, and it would apply to the school districts, whereas the 2010 bill didn't. Uh, and it's predicated on the assumption that a reduced contribution will, over a long period of time, because the new pension tier, which the governor wisely got legislated, mm -hmm. uh, uh, will cost less. And therefore, if you maintain the premiums at the level uh, that they're, or the contributions, that ultimately it'll break even. But that's based on an assumption that is demonstrably silly, which is that in prosperous times, we won't improve the benefits under Tier 6. We've never had a pension tier once that hasn't been legislatively improved upon. Pension sweeteners pass, have passed every year in the New York State Legislature, and generally without even being noted as a newsworthy event uh, by the media. When you, when the task force did the report on New York in particular, were there any surprises? I mean, you've been around a long time. You've looked at Medicaid. You've looked at the MTA. You've looked at state finances for a long time. Were there surprises? What said? What what just jumped out at you? Well, <clears throat> what jumped out to me uh, was the extent to which New York State had balanced its budget over the last 20 years by using borrowings and the proceeds of asset sales, the one treated shots. them as, as, as recurring revenues. And the failure of the state to adopt what New York City adopted in 75, which is a gap of generally accepted accounting principles to govern the way they budget. Uh, and to make sure that there was a, a, an oversight to, uh, and a mechanism that would produce uh, truly uh, balanced budgets. Uh, and the failure to even consider that at a time when uh, deficits were growing, I think indicated there's an enormous resistance on the part of the political system and the people who finance the political system to make any changes. Why? What do they gain? Well, or is I, it just fear of losing something? Uh, I think everybody enjoys uh, the, the, the current situation. The unions, quite understandably, don't want to see massive layoffs. Sure. Uh, they don't want to see pension benefits eroded. Or health, retiree uh, health care or lose any retiree health care, so they fight, uh, and that's their job. That's what union leaders get paid for. Sure. 
uh, banks are eager to uh, discount future revenues in order to solve today's problems uh, because they make massive fees in the process. Um, and the rating agencies are quite willing to go along with this uh, as we take revenues from the future and discount them uh, to provide current cash. So all the big players have a, almost a vested interest yes, in sir. the status quo and any change in the rules endangers them. That is correct. So why are you optimistic? Because we're getting to the point where more and more local governments are going to run out of cash. Okay, so we need, I mean, basically we need the, this fiscal apocalypse that the city went through in well, 1975 uh, and 76 to bring people to their senses? I hope that the experience we had in 75, although there are not very many people around who went, <laughs> nice. lived through it. Uh, I got a, my lay, I've got my layoff letter from the New York City Board of Ed in the first wave of the fiscal crisis. I have it in plastic. I, you know, some of us are old enough. Send me a copy. I'd like to include it in my book. I, I, well, oh, yeah, wait. <laughs> Before we get to your book, though, let's talk about medic. Let's talk about some of the big items that you mentioned. Medicaid, let's talk about debt, and let's talk about fiscal stress. You talked about local governments going bankrupt, counties, municipalities, oh, towns. Bankrupt, uh, bankrupt has two separate okay. names. As a term of art, it means that you're broke. That's what I'm but using. What it, it as. means, literally, to is, the smart guys. is a federal statute that you file and uh, go under the jurisdiction of a federal court. Okay, let's use let's use the first notion that local governments are badly strained. You know, there's some illiquid local jurisdictions, Nassau, Suffolk, Syracuse, Rochester. I mean, you have a whole bunch of counties you're, and cities. We're all in the same pickle. Uh, Different mayors and county execs speak differently. Nassau County's already got a control board. Uh, Buffalo's got a control board. Uh, the so mayor, mayor of Syracuse got a first-rate head on her shoulders and a lot of guts, and she's just saying, please, I want a dialogue. Right. This is a problem not of my making and not of the governor's making, but let's sit down and figure out a solution. But nobody wants to hear that from her in particular. Well, I'm not sure that's not That's true. okay. So what do you do? So you've got this massive local fiscal stress. You've got this structural imbalance at the local as well as at the state level. What, what well, ought the state be doing? And what ought localities be doing? Well, I think the members doing? of the state legislature ought to start paying more attention to the uh, local governments uh, that are encompassed in the districts they represent and understand they have to take an active role in this dialogue because they have the same power that the governor has. They have the power to impose tax and they have the power to cut uh, state spending. And, uh, you know, the, the, the governor did the right thing in trying to stem the growth of Medicaid and education, which are the two largest sure. expenditures. Uh, and and where, where that ultimately goes and what pressures that that generates is something we don't yet fully know. But clearly, he did the right thing. And he did the right thing in creating a new pension tier. But that doesn't save money in the short term. Okay. You've talked about uh, a medical industrial complex in New York that, in a sense, feeds off this massive program. Who is this? Who is the, what is this well, complex and what are the play? Is it the unions that you mentioned? Is it the course, medical partially, establishments? It's partially the union that represents the health care workers in the private hospital systems and in the, in the nursing homes. It's partially nursing home operators. Right. Uh, Hospital. A very substantial percentage of, and more so in New York State than anywhere else, goes to pay uh, for home care and nursing home care. Uh, uh, for people already uh, on Medicare, actually, but whose, whose long-term care is paid for uh, out of the Medicaid budget, uh, and the, the medical profession and, and the hospitals. Uh, it's a pretty powerful array of forces. Well, and they're legitimately concerned sure. about their ability sure. to continue to provide services to the public. Oh. So this isn't a good guy versus bad no, guy. No, 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 but it's a multifaceted game, and if the end of the game is fiscal meltdown, somebody's got to move. 
Yes, well, I think everybody's going to move a bit. Uh, and that's the question is, will our political system uh, force everybody to do that which they think at the moment they don't want to do and hope? Everybody hopes the other guy will make the sacrifice, but they're all going to have to, and that's going to require a level of leadership that's, that's significant. Is it there? I hope so. You're looking at the 2013 race. Have you spoken to the candidate, the, the variety of I think announced I have, candidates? Yes, I, I think I Response have. Response without friends. naming names? They're all friends. I think they're all uh, uh, doing what is perfectly understandable politically. They're uh, looking at the constituencies they need to win the election and trying to uh, say... Uh, uh, soothing words that will encourage Wow, support. this is, okay. Uh, so they're being is, politic. They are being, well, they're, we live in uh, democracy and politics is the art and science of government and the art and science of getting elected. Okay. Let's, so I don't have any rectitude about it. I'm worried that I don't know to what extent these people actually understand how serious a fiscal budgetary problem they're going to have next January, uh, but they'll, they'll find out soon enough. Okay, you mentioned your book. I, 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 I was waiting to ask you what, I mean, after you have more than 50 years of experience in all this stuff and, and, and going to a book, in a sense, I'm teaching you a book to my class, my graduate class at Baruch. What are the, the four or five lessons from your experience about <laughs> politics, government, policy? That we have an extraordinary history in this country. We survived a, a, a Cold War, a Civil War, uh, a, a, a society torn apart by racial uh, hatred and division. Uh, we've solved mammoth problems. Uh, we went through a depression uh, uh, that had tens of millions of people un unemployed or underemployed. And we fought three, three wars. Two, two world wars, and we solve those problems. We can solve this problem. It requires a level of competence and integrity in politics uh, that hopefully will attract more and more talented young people to go into politics, because it's only through politics that you solve problems of this kind. Or else, if that doesn't work, then we end up with a man on the white horse or in bankruptcy court uh, with judges deciding uh, who benefits and who gets burdened. And that's an intolerable thing if you, if your overriding conviction is that the most important thing to protect is the democratic process. And that's what my book's about. In your experience, are there any analogs to the current situation that might give us guidance? No, I, I mean, you talked about 1975 and the, and the response to of, uh, to the fiscal crisis by the variety of players. Is well, states defaulted on their obligations, not all of them, but a number of them did in the Depression. Uh, and it took years for the court system, uh, the judicial system, to, to finally adjudicate how those burdens ought to be, uh, ought to be dealt with. Um, but, but you would prefer, I presume, to have it resolved in, 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 the, in the realm of politics rather yes, than absolutely. moving it into the realm of the courts. And, absolutely. Okay. Sort of last, last set of questions. If you, you list all of these significant problems in the report. Clearly, they're all going on at once, and in some sense, they all need policy responses now. But in terms of priority, are there one or two elements that are, in a sense, or policy sine qua nons that you would recommend I, both the, gov the, the state government and city government to address? The tax system. Uh, and I think there's a commission uh, chaired by uh, Peter Solomon, who's mm -hmm. a very able citizen, uh, that's looking at it uh, that was created by the governor for the purpose of looking at the at the state revenue system. We have some very conspicuous holes. Uh, we, there are a lot of, uh, like sales on the internet, that escape taxation. So sales taxes haven't grown as they should have grown. Um, and in a society where we should be encouraging more uh, production as against consumption, uh, maybe we ought to begin to think about how our tax system ought to reflect what our, 
what our social and, and economic objectives are. Uh, we also have a lot of people who don't pay any taxes, and in the views of many, uh, the very richest people in the society uh, should be paying a higher percentage of their of their true gross income. And not uh, only not only human people, but persons known as corporations as well tend to, you know. Yeah, but that's a very sensitive balance because you don't want to drive people in other jurisdictions. Okay. And the 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 problem is that if you if you look to have more and more of the cost of government come from the smallest tax base, the local tax base, mm -hmm. you produce a very inefficient uh, uh, and unfair system. You know, the, the viewers should be reminded of the fact that Richard Nixon, hardly known as a great liberal, concluded on the advice of Pat Moynihan some 40 years ago that the federal government was a better tax collector than right. state and local governments, uh, and he instituted a program of general revenue sharing uh, in which money, tax, federal tax dollars were distributed to the states in accordance with population, not cockamamie formulas such as uh, we have for the distribution of Medicaid money today. And, and transportation, I mean, you'd name it. And um, uh, we have to go back and start thinking about fundamentals like that. So we have to think about taxes and we have to, and revenues, and we have to think about uh, retirement obligations, and we have to figure out how to put some kind of, of control over the growth of health care costs in the United States. We have to bend the health care cost curve. That's not just a question of, of government. Uh, of Medicaid and Medicare, we have to bend the rate of growth that health care costs have represented in our society for so long. Wow, what an agenda. Uh, budgets April 1st likely to be passed. Do you see anything within the next year that bends this, these curves that, that are being proposed now? I think you could well see in Washington reductions in the domestic discretionary budget of the federal government that will have a, an impact on the state and the city. Adverse. Adverse. I don't see any good news coming out of Washington oh, as far God. as that is concerned. Okay, you're going to have to come back. I know you're optimistic, but having read this, and even after our half hour here, I'm not convinced, so you have to come back and give me more convincing. I'd be delighted. My thanks to Richard Ravitch. Next week, we'll talk with Sam Roberts about his latest book, Grand Central, How a Train Station Transformed America, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>